Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Executive Director of the U.S. Climate Alliance, Casey Kadams. <laughs> New Jersey Governor, Phil Murphy. And please join me in welcoming the 57th Governor of the great state of New York, Governor Kathy Hochul. Good morning, everybody. My name is Casey Kadams, and I am Executive Director of the U.S. Climate Alliance. I am absolutely thrilled to be joining you here in New York City during one of my favorite times of the year. And no, I'm not talking about the UN General Assembly or the last day of summer. I'm talking about Climate Week. And today, we're in luck because we're joined by not one, but two of America's top climate leaders, New York Governor Kathy Hochul and New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy. Now, while these two may have very different opinions about where to find the best pizza or bagels in the region, they are in lockstep when it comes to confronting the climate crisis. They know that climate change transcends state lines and that our climate solutions need to as well. In a moment, we'll get to hear from each of them about how their states are leading the charge. Now, we're proud at the Alliance to be at the very center of this kind of partnership. You see, it's our job to make collaboration like this possible, not just here in the New York and New Jersey region, but across the country. And that's exactly what we're doing. Today, our Climate Action Coalition is two dozen governors strong, and it spans every region of the country, from Hawaii to Vermont, from Michigan to Louisiana, from New Mexico to North Carolina. Our governors represent nearly 60% of the US economy and 55% of the population. Governors in the Alliance are taking ambitious steps to make sure that we meet our climate goals driving down emissions, deploying clean energy, and increasing resilience to the impacts of climate change. But most importantly, millions of Americans are benefiting from the bold, sustained, and innovative action that our governors are taking. In fact, earlier this week, we released findings that showed that compared to the rest of the country, states in the Alliance pollute less, save more energy, employ more clean energy workers, prepare more effectively for climate impacts and disasters, and generate more electricity from zero carbon sources. It's clear... <laughs> it's clear as day that climate action means better health, cleaner air, a stronger economy, and a more prosperity for everyone. And it's also clear that we can go much further and much faster when we do it together. So as the political winds shift and legal uncertainty persists in DC, our governors and our states will be the ones who are continuing to move full speed ahead. We will continue to supercharge climate action and what we do will set the pace for the nation and even the world. This year, the Alliance celebrated a real milestone, five years since our coalition was formed. That's five years of collaboration, innovation and action. And as a founding state co-chair, New York has been with us from the very start, which is one of the many reasons I'm so proud to introduce our first speaker, New York Governor Kathy Hochul. <laughs> Under Governor Hochul's leadership, what, let, me, let me tout her just for a minute. Um, Under Governor Hochul's leadership, New York is on path to achieve its mandated goal of a zero emission electricity sector by 2040 including 70% renewable energy generation by 2030, and to reach economy-wide carbon neutrality. And in case you missed it, yesterday, Governor Hochul issued an executive order committing New York State to 100% renewable energy in state operations by 2030 while prioritizing disadvantaged communities. And if that wasn't enough, the governor is back today with even more. So with that, please help me welcome Governor Hochul. Good morning. What a spectacularly beautiful day here in New York. Uh, first of all, I do want to thank Casey for using his talents uh, that he attained in many positions, but also as a leader at the EPA to help, 
help all of us at the state level make sure we're doing the right thing. So uh, to Casey Kadams, I want to thank you for being the executive director of our alliance here. So let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Alan Steele, people are in your building. Uh, it's extraordinary. We've been through here from the entire pandemic. And I have to tell you what you did in terms of providing a space, a safe place, a place we could do vaccinations. We were prepared to handle as many people as necessary here. So you got us through that, but also the stress of all the bookings that had come and gone. And now I feel like we are back. And it is evidenced by the noise in the next rooms and all the activity and the energy. But there's one more thing I'm really looking to do is to help land a very nice presidential convention here in a couple of years, so I'm out there. The mayor and I were just uh, down in Washington about a week ago showing them what we're made out of, and we definitely had more fun in our room than they did in the others. Just an observation, uh, a little bias here. Uh, Lee Perlman, thank you for being the chair of the Convention Center Operating Corporation. Yes, good things are happening, and you've always been sort of the epicenter of Climate Week, and we're grateful for what you do here as well. And to have a governor, a governor that I am in sync with philosophically on so many key issues. We realize that working together, our entire region can really rise to a new level. And I'm grateful that Phil Murphy has joined us here once again to show the collaboration among our states. And that's what our residents want to know about. So let's give a round of applause to Governor Phil Murphy. Well, yes, you know what's going on this week. It's Climate Week. It's UN General Assembly, Clinton Global Initiative, Fashion Week just wrapped up. And if anybody doubts that we're fully supercharged, try to drive across Midtown. Uh -huh. uh, and it feels good. It feels good. I did not like the fact that I could zip across Manhattan in almost no time a year and a half ago. So this is a good feeling. It feels like we're back. And I love, love, love to see that New York is back. And of course, the Javits Center. I mean, to get through the expansion during the pandemic, the 1.2 million square feet, that's extraordinary. And it is a, a magnet for conventions, meetings, gatherings all over the world. So uh, really proud of what we're doing here as well. And also, uh, we're, we're really excited about having climate. I literally was here, I think I was on the job about three weeks. And I stood out there and took a tour to see what we're going to be talking about the completion of today. And I just thought, I'm in awe of what was going on during this pandemic, but also how you just kept it all going, that we did not lose sight of our climate objectives, even though Mother Nature had us focused on other issues for a solid two years. We never gave up uh, our focus there. So I'm going to have an update on that shortly, but I uh, just want to talk about, to all of you, why protecting the environment is so important to me personally, why I'm such a environmental activist myself. And you can look up Wikipedia, you know how old I am. Uh, I was there when the, uh, the first uh, Environmental Justice Day started. We didn't call it that then, but uh, Earth Day. It was called Earth Day. And I was in school and I helped start the first ecology club because I wanted to do what I could with my young talents. But also, I come from an area where when you, people talk about you know clean air, clean water, and sort of you know, hypothetical terms, what does it really feel like when you don't have it? That's the world I lived in. I lived in a world that did not have clean air and clean water as a birthright. Uh, it was something that when you grow up in an, in an upstate manufacturing steel town, the focus was always on the jobs. I mean, 20,000 people made steel, my grandpa made steel, my dad made steel. You worked in those factories because it was a good paying job and you can lift your family up out of the middle class, in, into the middle class. So that's the world I came from. Um, thank God a lot has changed. It's absolutely beautiful in these communities. Uh, sites that have once been steel plants now have onshore wind turbines. I mean, right out my old window, it's spectacular. But it was also a long time the home of our nation's worst polluters. And you know, as I said, I mentioned my parents' solar park right there. I went back to visit again just recently. I always go back to the neighborhood. But there was this ominous feeling. There was always this orange smoke that enveloped the skies. I didn't know the skies were supposed to be blue. They were literally orange from the, the toxins being released in the air from the, from the smokestacks that dotted the landscape. And Lake Erie, one of the largest freshwater lakes on this planet, is where we used to swim. 
not sure it was the smartest thing we did. We didn't know any better, but uh, my mom would take us down the beach and we'd see the steel plant in the background. And at night, you didn't want to be there at night because the sky was glowing with this, looked like molten lava being dumped into Lake Erie and we'd go back again and swim the next day. No comment on that. Uh, uh, but people didn't know any better or they didn't care or there was a disconnect and not a sense that this is wrong. Uh, these assaults that were on Mother Nature had been going on for decades, and it was just part of the Industrial Revolution, and people accepted that as a price. And again, it was never questioned. So my story is not unique. You know, we still have people today living uh, in these situations. And I'm focused on this laser focus. If you live in a community where it has dirty air, dirty water, and you develop asthma, as a result of your surroundings, or if your homes and livelihoods are becoming vulnerable to the extreme weather, and this is something we didn't even talk about back then. I was from Buffalo. We always expected bad weather. Um, but today, communities that never had even entertained the thought of having to deal with a hurricane are now having to build resiliency because these 100-year events are now happening with greater frequency. And that is why, even again, I was fairly new in the job. I had to deal with not one but the effect of two hurricanes literally this time last year. So all these call us to say environmental justice means we acknowledge it and we lean hard into it. And we no longer keep those blinders on. And I refuse to accept anyone who has a different opinion because there is an urgency. There is an urgency that we all must feel in our hearts. So uh, what else are we going to do? We're also recognizing the fact that it's almost the 10th anniversary of Sandy. Our cleanup and our work continues there, building resiliency. But I would say this. We are truly the first generation that has felt the impact of climate change, and we're the last generation to be able to do anything about it. That's the sense of urgency that the people in this room and elsewhere are gathered to talk about. So we, commit, we make commitments. We have a lot of commitments here in New York. You'll hear about commitments in New Jersey. This is powerful. You have to have leadership that says, no, I'm going to right that wrong. And yes, there may be consequences. Yes, there may be a price tag. But my God, you know, how much more warning do we need that the time to act was not just today, but it was also yesterday? So we have to make up for lost time. So we have the most ambitious renewable energy and emission goals in the, in the country. 70% of renewables by 2030, electricity, 70% of electricity will be right, renewables by 2030. 85% emission reductions by 2050. I'm not afraid of saying that. Uh, we have the bold agenda that actually meets that, and everyone who's ever worked with me knows that I'm also going to say, and I want to shave time off those goals. No matter what you tell me, tell me it's going to take a couple years to put in cameras in a subway. I'm going to say, no, I think we can do that in about 18 months. Uh, so whatever it is, you know I'm going to pressure, push it even sooner. So what are we also focused on? Last year I announced $4.2 billion. Now, this is a large amount of money. But that's for our clean water, clean air, green jobs, environmental bond act. I need to have everybody who cares about human life on this planet and lives in the state of New York to mobilize to make sure the vote gets out in support of this bond act. I need everyone in this room to have a sustained effort so we don't look back and say we missed the opportunity because we didn't get enough people to care in time for this important ballot initiative on November 8th. And if it happens, and the voters see the wisdom of this, and we hope they will. It can be a game-changing investment in our infrastructure for our clean energy future. We also made the largest investment in the Environmental Protection Fund, $500 million investment also in offshore wind. That is extraordinary. And what we're doing is creating the supply chain. You know what I get so excited about? We talk about the industrial base of upstate New York, where I came from a lot of shuttered factories for a long time until we had reuses. One thing we're doing at the Hudson River, Hudson River, Henry Hudson, remember that name? 1600s, brought commerce up to a place like Albany. Years later, 100, 200 years later, we opened up the Erie Canal. Now we're using the Hudson as the vehicle to bring down component parts for offshore wind turbines that are manufactured in the port of Albany, coming down the river and going off the coast of Long Island to build this new future. That's what we're talking about. But I also want to make sure that as a state we're leading as well. I'm not going to tell the private sector what to do if we're not prepared to make those same decisions internally. We are going to transition 
to 100 percent renewable energy in all state operations by the year 2030. I'm making that commitment right now. We're going to get that done. And our state agencies, state agencies will have net zero investment portfolios by 2040, and this will be over $40 billion in investment. Last, I mentioned that last week I was here to talk about Climate Week, and I stood here and said, we're going big. My philosophy is go big or go home, and I'm never going home. Uh, we're always going to go big, and that's why we announced two renewable, two enormous renewable energy transmission projects. Uh, they're truly transformative, bringing 1.7 gigabots of upstate power, wind and solar from the Hudson Valley, as well as the Champlain-Hudson line, bringing wonderful, wonderful power from Canada down to power the homes here in New York City. And that's going to bring in 18 million megawatt hours of renewable energy from Canada, as I said, in upstate New York. That's enough. What is that? 18 million. People are like, 18 million? I say, what? 18 million gigawatt? What does that mean? That's enough power to power every home in New York City. Every home in New York City can receive its power source from renewables coming down from the hydroelectric power from Canada as well as our wind and solar farms. And so I'm excited about this. Uh, we also have enough large-scale solar projects to power 620,000 homes. That's great. We also expanded our New York Sun program with an additional four gigawatts of distributed power. I know this is, these are just numbers, but I want to know how many houses. How many houses are affected? And this is going to power over 700,000 homes. So you add up all these numbers, add them all up. We're making a huge difference, profound difference. And so we're also capable of powering 4 million homes. So all this together, 4 million homes as of last year. I mean, since we made those announcements and went big, we will now be able to power 4 million New York homes with renewable energy use by 2030. That's amazing. And that's just what we did in the last year. So let's talk about what's on the horizon. Last summer, we, we launched our third solicitation for offshore wind. I'm telling you, the future is offshore wind. Two gigawatts of, for projects, enough to power 1.5 million homes. And today, those of you paying attention, you want to jump on this one, we're announcing our sixth competitive solicitation calling for 2,000 megawatts or more of large-scale renewable projects. And that's enough for another 600,000 additional homes across the state. So, Anybody wants to bid, get out of the room right now and get first in line because it's, I'm, I'm announcing it's right here, right now. Uh, so this is going to be another massive job creator. I didn't say this before, but this is what gets me fired up as well, as we transition from those old smokestack jobs to the clean energy revolution. With many of the same workers, if you're smart about this, you can use their talents, their skills, and transition them into the jobs that are going to lead our economy for the next two generations. So this is going to spur over $3 billion worth of clean energy investments, powering many more homes. So now again, we're talking about once I add up what we're planning, we did last year, what we're planning to do that we just proposed, we're now going to be able to have 7.5 million households in New York State committed to having this renewable energy source. As we also were here last year, we talked about what's going on out the window. This is very exciting. Alan and I walked through, we examined uh, the innovation the brilliance behind having solar panels, its largest solar panels. Uh, is it around the world, Alan? Should I say the world? Close enough? All right, all right. We're New Yorkers. We could brag a little bit. All right, New York. So, so, certainly the largest solar array in New York, uh, in New York City. And it's the, the largest one in any van, any, anyone thought of this. I mean, it's just it's amazing. So take a look at that. These panels will produce a million kilowatt hours of solar power in the first year of operation. That's enough to charge. 40 million cell phones, 40 million cell phones. Now, I have another, as an aside, why does the cell phone hold the charge longer? I mean, I, I, I go to, I, I, I seriously, I go to like, I go to Dr. Stanley Whittingham, who's the godfather of the lithium ion battery, gets Nobel Prize winner, Binghamton. Can you just figure out how to have the cell phones hold the charge longer? I mean, how about a day, how about a week? So I'm just putting that challenge out there. Anybody wants to meet that challenge, I'll announce the winner next year. Just get it done. <laughs> So we, this, this is extraordinary. That will offset 750,000 pounds of carbon a year as well. That's amazing. And also it's going to have 3.35 uh, megawatts of battery storage. So, uh, so thank you, Alan, for your commitment to this. Uh, this is what you've accomplished. We're announcing the completion of over 1,400 panels today. And also to Lee Perlman and the entire board for what you've done. So, so 
I know I threw a lot of numbers at you, a lot of houses, a lot of this and that, but the bottom line is we are all in. New York State is all in with our other climate leaders, and these are the states. You've heard, particularly since uh, the end of the last session of the Supreme Court, how important state governments are, how important the vision of their leaders are, and what a difference that can make for people. So we cannot do this alone. And I'm proud to be a co-chair of the U.S. Climate Alliance uh, and working closely with a state like New Jersey because this is a regional strategy, a regional approach, because any pollution generated in the state of New York or New Jersey is going to find its way to the other one. We're that close. Uh, we're part of the same family. So uh, we believe in working on this together because climate change, the effects of climate change, have no borders. They don't stop at our borders, and that's why we're going to continue focusing on eliminating this existential threat. So I want to thank our senators, our president, first of all, our president Biden, for what he's done in Washington, leaning hard into this, uh, passing significant legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, there's a large environmental component to that to help reduce our greenhouse emissions. Senator Schumer, Majority Leader, Kirsten Gillibrand, our entire delegation. I always want to make sure they get credit as well. They get credit as well because I served in Congress. I know what it's like when you don't have those relationships and that partnership. And speaking of partnership, there is no greater partnership than we have with the state of New Jersey right now. And it comes down to the individuals, the commitment, the commitment to do what's right for the people of our region, because we are in this together. And with that, let me introduce uh, an amazing individual, a strong leader for our, our region and for our, our friends in New Jersey. That is the governor himself. And we were just talking around about some of our football teams. We won't, should we get into that or no? That's a little too controversial. Uh, he, he did say the Buffalo Bills are doing really well. Can I at least say that? Okay, he admitted that. So, uh, so uh, uh, I hope that doesn't get you in trouble. I know, he said he loves his teams that play in New Jersey. Okay, he loves them. We all love all of our teams. But, uh, but what a year for the Bills. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you, thank you. We, we have a, uh, Kathy, more on you in a moment, but we have a, hey Ed, we have a backdrop that would make Hollywood jealous because it includes, Alan, not only your solar panels, and congratulations to you and the team for that initiative. It's a game changer. But you also have in the distance the Federal Republic of New Jersey. So. <laughs> That combination is, uh, is a killer any day of the week. And as, as it relates to sports, Kathy knows it's a complicated thing for me. First of all, the Bills are the best team in football right now. Uh, I, I was born in Boston, which gets me no votes in New Jersey, and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, good, good, uh, good morning, everybody. What a treat it is to be here. I have wanted to come here many times since the last time I was here. But the pandemic, running for governor the first time, and then the pandemic really put the kibosh on, on those visits. But the last time I was here was election night in 2016. Uh, and boy, am I glad to be back on a much happier occasion than that night. So was, we'll leave it at that. Uh, really, really thrilled. Casey, to you and your colleagues uh, at the Climate Alliance, thank you for everything you do. Casey hails from the state of Washington. Uh, and Kathy and I have a great colleague, Jay Inslee, who Casey worked for, who's a, a, another example of a, of a governor with an extraordinary environmental record. Thank you to you, Casey, and all of your colleagues. Again, to Alan and the team here at the Javits Center. The place looks great. Thrilled to be here. And Kathy, uh, thank you so much for hosting me and everybody here, including some other friends from Jersey so graciously. Um, we had a very productive private conversation before coming out here on our partnership across the river uh, on, on building a more sustainable future. And again, as Kathy said, not just for our individual states, but for our region. We are the most densely populated state in America. When you staple New York City and the inner suburbs in New York State to that reality, it is far and away the most densely populated uh, section of America, never mind all of the, all of the upstate uh, realities that you have here in New York. So I, I want to, at the end of my remarks, I'll, I'll pat ourselves on the back on some Jersey stuff for a few minutes, but at the end, I want to come back to how important that, that partnership is, but we could not have a better partner than Governor Hochul. So we're not unique, but New Jersey just came off 
our hottest August on record. We are being battered, as Kathy said, by ever stronger storms from Su Stu Superstorm Sandy. Again, 10th anniversary, it's hard to believe. Uh, next month, we still have families who are not back on their feet and in their homes 10 years later. To the remnants of Hurricane Ida, which crushed Jersey and New York, which unleashed, among other things, in our state, downstate, in South Jersey, uh, wicked tornadoes, and in the northern part of our state and in New York City, devastating flooding. We know climate change is not only real, but it's existential, and that's why we're in this fight for all we are worth. In our administration's first term, we set an achievable goal of a 100 percent green energy state economy by the year 2050. We are leaning hard, especially, not only, but especially into offshore wind. And we are positioning New Jersey to be the focal point for offshore wind component manufacturing and logistics and marshalling, not just along the east, eastern seaboard, but nationally. We're investing separately, heavily, in electric vehicle infrastructure. We put in place innovative new policies to expand solar, as New York State is doing such a great job at, especially into the environmental justice communities which have been overlooked and bypassed for, for far too long. We wrote strong incentives for adaptive building, reuse, and energy efficiency into our new business attraction and retention programs. And today, we will take additional steps to work to build a strong and sustainable green energy economy. So first up today, I will sign an executive order increasing our target for offshore wind electric generation by nearly 50 percent from the current goal of 7,500 megawatts by the year 2035 to a goal of 11,000 megawatts by the year 2040. <laughs> Shamelessly fishing for applause. <laughs> this is an aggressive target, but it is an achievable one when we combine the offshore wind plans currently in place and moving forward with the opportunities in the recently auctioned portions, as Kathy knows, of the New York bite, and the technological advancements that are making turbines more and more efficient, almost literally, by the day. Moreover, this order will direct our team to continue exploring the feasibility of pushing this goal further onward. Reaching this goal will allow us to power millions of New Jersey homes and businesses with green and reliable energy derived from something we have all taken for granted for a long time, the breezes off the Jersey Shore. Achieving this goal will create thousands of jobs up and down the supply chain, strengthening our economy from end to end. Few people have done more to help us achieve the premise of offshore wind than the president of the Board of Public Utilities, Joe Fiordaliso, and I don't think Joe is here, but I want to thank him in absentia. And again, we're building the offshore wind industry supply chain base right in New Jersey. We will be at the forefront, and we will be able to close the entire loop from manufacturing to installation to generation within our state. Today, we are also releasing an offshore wind jobs analysis, which confirms that the investments we're making in offshore wind are also investments in our people and our economy. But wait, there's more. I feel like I'm in the midst of a Ginsu knife commercial. <laughs> Eighteen months ago, I created the New Jersey Council on the Green Economy, bringing together folks from across industry, organized labor, and the full spectrum of advocates like Ed Potosnek, who's here from the New Jersey League of Conservation Voters, among others, and thinkers. This is a truly nation-leading effort focusing on leveraging investment and expertise in a way that no one else is. I asked my wife, who sends her best regards, First Lady Tammy Murphy, who, by the way, has been involved nationally in the climate arena for two decades, especially with the Climate Reality Project, which is Al Gore's uh, outstanding vehicle. I asked Tammy to lead this effort as honorary chair with Jane Cohen, who's the head of my Office of Climate Action and the Green Economy, serving as an executive director. Jane, please stand up and take a bow. Jane is with us today.
and the co-chairs, and this will give you a sense, as Kathy alluded to, this is a whole of government approach. So anybody who thinks this is just a de de Department of Environmental Protection initiative, which it obviously is, is missing the broader picture. So the chairs are the, are the president of the Board of Public Utilities. I mentioned him, Joe Fiordaliso. Our labor commissioner, Rob Acero Angelo. The commissioner of environmental protection, as I mentioned, Sean LaTourette. And the Economic Development Authority CEO, Tim Sullivan. And the council members, and I thank all of them for the work they have done and continue to do. So I tasked the council with not only creating the roadmap for building the workforce we will need to meet the challenge of leading the green economy, but also directed it to put a special emphasis on ensuring that this workforce meets two goals. First, that it ensures diversity and opens doors for good careers for residents, especially from our environmental justice communities. This is not only the most densely populated region in America, it's the most diverse region in America. And I know Governor Hochul shares this with me. We wear that as a badge of honor. And second, that it provides opportunities for current workers, and especially the union workforce with deep roots in the energy fields, to bring their hard-earned skills and invaluable experience to bear for our shared future. So today, I am proud to release the Council's report and put in motion an aggressive 12-month plan. And I'm proud to highlight $10 million in new investments, which are part of our new state budget's more than $30 million investment to deliver an inclusive, diverse, and skilled workforce. This, thank you. This new investment includes additional supports to help maintain and grow critical workforce development programs, to help solve for transportation skill gaps, childcare, and other barriers preventing new workers from entering the green economy, and to support the development specifically of the offshore wind workforce. The report underscores our whole of government approach and builds bridges between the public and the private sectors. And I must note the private sector partners who signed our corporate green jobs pledge in support of growing and sustaining a diverse, inclusive green workforce. And Jane, it's fair to say I'm going to read some names that are signed on, and we expect many more to sign on in the period ahead. The names include Unilever, DSM, Hugo New, IKEA, Siemens, and Hackensack Meridian Health, among others. So when I was first running for governor, I was often asked about my plans for tackling climate change and creating a green energy economy. Even then, my focus was on reducing on fossil fuels, incenting energy efficiency and green building practices, going all in on the promise of offshore wind and solar energy, and building the diverse and talented workforce necessary to get these jobs done. If you read the headlines, it seems there's a lot of jockeying between New York and New Jersey. But the reality is very different. Our states are not competing with each other, even as we are both laced up for this race. I like to think of this as a cross-country meet. It's not about the individual times. It's about the team score. And while we're still running for personal bests, because we've got that pride and we want to all be head of the class, we don't win unless we each pull each other along so that the team wins. It is the ultimate one plus one equals three reality. What each of us in New Jersey and New York is doing speaks volume, volumes to our deeply held core beliefs about our need to reach for a more sustainable and resilient collective future, and through that, creating exciting new jobs and a more sustainable and resilient economy. It's about supporting our current workforce in accessing the growing number of green jobs and at the same time maximizing its potential for residents of communities on the front lines of climate change. I've said many times before that for far too long the American people, and Kathy alluded to this, have been fed a false narrative that we can either focus on the environment or we can focus on the economy, but not both. And at no point was this false narrative being shopped louder than the previous federal administration. 
what each of our administrations are proving and what the Biden administration is also proving, importantly, right alongside of us, is how dead wrong that thinking in those prior policies and politics were and are. This is not an either-or proposition. It is all-in and both. And I want to conclude with one more comment about our extraordinary ho host, uh, Governor Hochul, today. I cannot imagine, literally, as someone whose nose is pressed up against the New Jersey-New York glass with so much common interest and so much at stake for our residents, I cannot fathom this state being led by anyone else than Governor Kathy Hochul. Thank you.